And welcome to another episode of the Bull and the Bear podcast. I'm Matt Clark. Uh, glad you are with us on, on uh, getting heading into a weekend, uh, which is uh, coming off of a, a long weekend into a regular weekend. We're kind of back on track at least till the 4th of July when that just flunks everything again. But uh, glad you're with us. Uh, just a reminder that we are on Apple Podcasts. We are on Google Podcasts. We're on Spotify. We're on a wealth of other podcast indicators. I want you to go on there and uh, give, us a, give us a comment, give us a review, let us know what you think. If you have... Uh, uh, topics that you'd like us to talk about on any given occasion, by all means, email us. It's the bull and bear at moneyandmarkets.com. Uh, you can reach out to us at any time there and let us know, and and uh, we'll certainly uh, take uh, take all that feedback seriously and and uh, and get into it. So, speaking of getting into it, I think it's a, a good time to do that. I'm going to bring in uh, Money and Markets Chief Investment Strategist Adam O'Dell. He is joining me today. First off, Adam, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on on this. Uh, I'm not sure if it's rainy, sunny, or what it's deciding to do today. It's uh, just, a, you know, I guess a typical June in South Florida but, and, and uh, uh, warm everywhere else. Uh, so it's uh, getting, getting, the summer, getting the summer kicked off on, on, a, on a good foot, I guess. So, but thank you for coming on and uh, joining us on this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we talked about this last week, um, and, and we kind of talked about it from kind of a 35,000 foot view. And, 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 but then I got to thinking about it more and I got to reading a little bit more. And, and, and what I'm speaking of is, is Chinese companies and Chinese stock. And I know China's big in the news in terms of its tensions with the United States and, and, and the, the phase one trade deal being in jeopardy and, and, and a wealth of other um, things that are going on both politically. You have the coronavirus, which is also a, a point of contention between Washington and Beijing. But what it's doing is it is, it is causing in terms of pressure, news pressure, on China, not necessarily stock pressure, and I'll get to that here in a second. But you know, the main question that I had was, if you look at specific companies in China that are listed on American exchanges, are they really worth buying? Uh, and especially if you consider that, you know, what, what, the, what the tensions are, what the news headlines are, and, and how things are cycling almost every day. Um, because the stock market is not behaving rationally by any stretch of the imagination. It's up now today massively. Uh, unemployment, thankfully, was, was down slightly, uh, uh, according to the Department of Labor t today. So that, that's good news. But when you're in a recessionary economy like we are in because of the coronavirus and other factors, you know, sometimes the market, you know, tends to, to, to take different directions. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later with Adam when we, when we dive deeper into that. But you know, I, I read a couple of interesting things. And, and first off, one thing I, I, I read was that, you know, the Senate has, has put out a, uh, has passed a bill. It has not gone to the House. It has not gone to the President. It's not law. But they have passed a measure um, that would increase the scrutiny on Chinese companies. Basically, what it would do is Chinese companies are listed on American exchanges, whether it be the NASDAQ, the Russell, the, the Dow, the, the you know, whatever index they're, they're listed on, whatever exchange they're on, um, they have to certify basically that their operations are not being controlled by the Chinese government. This all relates back to Huawei Technologies, which is a, a huge uh, component provider for 5G technology. In fact, there are countries all over the world that are continuing to use Huawei um, to build out their 5G infrastructure. The challenge here, or the, the issue came about because there, you know, there is law in China that says that if you are a Chinese-owned company, that you can be directed by the Chinese government to have your company used for state purposes. It doesn't really spe specify what those purposes are, but our immediate jump to conclusion is that it can be used to spy. It can be used to spy on foreign governments. It can be used to spy on foreign businesses. It can be used to spy on whatever. And, and that has prompted a, a major backlash from the Department of Commerce, from the White House, to, to essentially blacklist Huawei from ever being able to do business in the United States or even with American companies. Now, where this, how, this is now spread um, to, to suggest that if you are a Chinese company and you are doing you know, work at the behest of the Chinese government, you can be delisted from American stock exchanges. What this basically will do, if I understand correctly, and Adam, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but this would mean that a, a funnel of investment funds through the stock exchange here in the United States will be gone for Chinese companies. Chinese companies are listing on stock exchanges as any other company does because they're trying to raise funds. That, that's what they do. They're trying to raise capital for whatever reason. And that would be gone. So it puts pressure on China. Uh, but I, I think another thing that it does is it also causes investors to think, hmm, what should I be doing with my Chinese holdings? Because let's be honest, 
there are several Chinese companies out there that are performing very well. And we're going to talk about them here in just a second. So, you know, if I have these companies and they're performing well, my portfolio is bolstered nicely because I'm holding positions in them, but yet I hear these outside pressures, these political pressures, really, um, that are threatening those holdings. What do I do with them? Uh, you know, one option that Chinese companies have, uh, and, and I read this as well, is, is that, you know, if they get delisted from the U.S. exchange, they could pretty much list on the Hong Kong exchange. Um, now, the issue that I see there with that is that I think we're not necessarily comparing apples to apples with this, because if you look at the American exchange and you look at, I think it's the Hang Seng is what it is, what it is in, in Hong Kong. Um, if you compare those two, the investment potential is significantly lower in Hong Kong than it is in the United States, which is why Chinese companies are listed in the U.S. and not in Hong Kong. Um, it, it's not for any other reason outside the fact that they can get more money in the U.S. than they can from, from, from the special administrative state in Hong Kong. So it, it really puts Chinese companies in a corner. But then again, is this a nuclear option? Is this something that is just kind of a threat? Kind of a, if you don't behave, we're going to, you know, this is what we're going to do. So what I did is, is I looked at some specific companies, some specific big Chinese companies uh, that that uh, that do have a significant amount of investment, you know, from from U.S. investors, and I want to see first off how are they performing, and two, then I want to bring in Adam and say, okay, based on this information, is this something? You know, are these companies that you should be looking at or not? And I think the important factor here is that number one, you know, it's important to understand that as an investor, whether you are a rookie investor, whether you are an intermediate investor, or whether you do this for a living, uh, you know, it's important to kind of filter out the news cycle. And we've talked about this before. We've talked about this a tons of tons of times. And we can't really drill it home anymore uh, than, than that. But you know, the news moves on a 24 hour cycle every day. And that and 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 that's fine. That's that's just the nature of cable news, the internet, you know, it, whatever sources have, have, have come out there. But you have to understand that the market doesn't necessarily move at that same pace. And in fact it's probably better that it doesn't. If the market reacted to every single news item I, there'd be no telling what would be going on uh, in, in, in not only a, a macro, but a micro economical standpoint. So what I did first is I, I first looked at Alibaba. Now Alibaba, whose ticker is BABA, they are a, they are a Chinese e-commerce company. Basically you can consider them the Amazon of China and they are huge. They were started by Jack Ma and, and several investors and they have grown exponentially. This is a massive company. In fact, it is probably, if not the largest, one of the largest companies, not just in China, but in the world. And, and they have done well on, on the American exchange. Uh, if you, if you look, uh, if you just pull up the ticker BABA, um, since a, 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 a drop slightly in January of 2019, Alibaba has ticked up 67% to trade at about 218 a share, if not even higher. Um, their, their highs are high, uh, their lows are higher and, and, and the trend of this stock is, is a consistent upward trajectory. So really, if you think about that, if you, if you sweep away the fact that, that Alibaba is, is controlled in China, if you look at this, if Alibaba was just an American company, you know, indicators would almost suggest at least just in looking at it from the broad scope without getting into an in-depth method would tell you that this is a very strong company that you want to consider investing in. So the question then becomes, you know, now that you factor in that it's a Chinese company, should you invest in it? I did the same with, uh, I looked at Baidu Incorporated. Uh, Baidu is uh, uh, another strong Chinese company uh, and the, their indicators are a little bit different. Uh, they have trended upwards until about 2018 and since then they have started to, to, to dwindle. Uh, for one reason or another, but the fact that it dates back to 2018 would suggest that their 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 downward turn is not related to the fact that that there's added pressure on on Chinese companies. So at least that's what it would tell me. And, and then the last company I looked at was was JD.com. Uh, this is another Chinese control company. This is another internet company. Um, and if you think that Alibaba has has exploded, JD.com is even more so. This is a company that since 2019, since late 2018, has exploded by about 195%. It is well above its 200-day uh, and 50-day moving average. Right now, it's trading at about $56, $57 a share. Its 200-day moving average is $37. Uh, 
so, so it is it is moving wildly upwards and has uh, not suffered any significant downturns, even in February and March when the rest of the market was uh, what was pushing downward because of the coronavirus. I also looked at ten cent, but that is an over the counter stock, so I kind of took that out. I'll show the chart, but um, it's also kind of uh, it, it's flat to down. But I guess my question to Adam here is, if you look at those companies and maybe even just Chinese companies as a whole, um, you know, how, how do you make the determination as an investor if whether these are companies that if I'm investing in, I should hold and continue to invest in or sell, or if I'm someone looking to get into it, should I look at these companies at all? Yeah, let me jump in here, Matt. I mean, you made, you made a revealing, um, you revealed something about your own psyche and about all of investors' biases in, in something in, in the way you phrased that question to me. And you basically were uh, talking about Alibaba and you said, this, this looks like a great company. And if it were a US company, we'd be really interested in buying it. But since it's a Chinese company, should we still buy it? So that's very revealing to me as far as uh, your psychology. And I'm not picking on you. That's, that's the psychology of pretty much all investors. Uh, what it's called is it's called the home country bias. I've written about this before. There's a lot of research to, to support this idea. Uh, the home country bias basically says if I'm an American, I have a, a bias to invest in American stocks. If I'm Chinese, I have a bias to invest in Chinese stocks. Likewise, if I'm Australian, I'm going to have more of my portfolio in Australian stocks than I should. So this is a bias that's um, you know pervasive across the globe. We just feel more comfortable investing in stocks on our home turf. Maybe we shop at those stores and maybe we, we know people in the community that work at those companies. And we just feel for whatever reason, we feel like it's, it's more um, comfortable to, and safer to invest in those stocks. Uh, when in fact, there's really no outperformance that you can earn. You can't earn any alpha. You're not going to beat the market by investing in your home country stocks. If anything, you're going to give up investment returns uh, by, by forgoing uh, superior returns in, in outside the U.S. markets as a U.S. investor. So really, this is a bias that works against investors. It makes you feel safe. It does not actually put your, your portfolio any safer than if you invested outside the market. And really, you're giving up opportunities. So what I try to preach is you know be agnostic to where the stock is. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Chinese stocks per se. Cer certainly, there's some uh, opacity issues with knowing what's on their books. Certainly, there's some uh, government control issues that you touched on. But as as far as a an opportunistic trader, you need to decide whether you want to be a, a historian or a political analyst or a geopolitical uh, researcher, or if you want to be an investor that uh, basically pragmatically and practically uh, makes money. And so you know, for me, it's all about making money. It's about finding the opportunities where I'm going to get the, the highest probability trade, um, the least amount of risk, the most amount of potential reward. And that's a process I follow routinely, uh, whether it's U.S. stocks or Chinese stocks that I'm looking at. Um, to, to kind of touch on a couple of the, uh, the, the stocks you threw out there, it was interesting because you and I didn't talk about these three stocks before we got on this call. Um, I looked up, I did a presentation yesterday with some internal folks where I basically said, throw out, throw out any stock symbol. It could be a stock symbol that I've never heard of before. In fact, try to come up with a stock symbol that I've never heard of before. And I will put it into my Cycle 9 system. And within five seconds, I'll tell you whether I would buy that stock, sell that stock short, or just avoid it completely because it's kind of in no man's land. Um, so that's an exercise I actually did with uh, Alibaba, Baidu, and JD as well before we got on this call. And it's interesting that you, know, you kind of talked about their trends and more or less my trends, what I see as far as their trends matched up. So on the, on the downside, Baidu, Baidu is not a stock I would even consider buying right now. It's in a downtrend. Um, in Cycle 9, uh, we basically only buy stocks that are already trending higher because my research shows that that's a safer way to find high probability trades with less risk and, and more potential reward. So right now, Baidu uh, would not pass my first filter. It is in a negative trend. I would ignore it completely. Um, Alibaba, on the other hand, Alibaba has a positive uh, upward longer term trend, like you mentioned. It's higher, it has higher highs, higher lows. Uh, I believe it's above its 200-day moving average. Its six-month trend is positive. So a number of different methodologies for looking at trend that shows that um, Alibaba is on uh, what I would call my buy qualified list, meaning that it qualifies for a buy. It passes my first filter, but I still need to look far, further into it to see if it's, it's a good buy right now. So in the case of Alibaba, it is in an uptrend. But if you look at its momentum relative to the broader U.S. stock market, it does not have market beating momentum. Okay, so right now it's kind of going through a bit of a lull. Um, if I was going to make a short-term tactical trade uh, over two to three months at a time on Alibaba, I would wait. I would not do it right now. I'd wait for that signal to come once we start to see a little bit more of, of relative strength or relative outperformance over the, the market. 
Uh, and then thirdly, JD, I looked that one up. JD has exactly what we're looking for in a winning stock. It has a positive uptrend over the longer term, and it has market beating momentum over the U.S. broader stock market uh, to a degree, to, uh, at a degree to which uh, is quite unusual. So that is type of that's the type of signal that we're looking for: uh, a longer term uptrend, a shorter term momentum signal that is unusual. It's you know several standard deviations from what we would expect as average. And, uh, and that's the type of impulse signal that I would be looking for to trade on a Chinese stock. Uh, for instance, JD actually triggered my cycle nine buy signal on uh, March 12th. So basically right during the Corona crash was one of the stocks that was actually going counter to the crash. It came down some, but not nearly to the degree. And so since that signal, um, which is about three months old right now, the stock is up 50%. So that's the type of uh, gains that you can get in Chinese stocks if you time them correctly. But the point is you don't have to be in all Chinese stocks. You don't have to pick Chinese stocks based on whether you think this legislation is going to go through or whether you think it's just a head fake or whether you think that the Hong Kong market is just as good capital market as the U.S. Um, you know, it's not. But you don't have to make all of these political or qualitative um, assessments of the U.S.-China war right now. All you have to do is really look at the prices. The prices of these stocks and, and how they're trading will tell you whether there's real money going into these stocks. If the stock is trending higher, if it's trending higher with market beat and momentum, that's evidence enough that investors are wanting to get into the stock and that they're willing to pay higher and higher prices. They're willing to bid up the stock. And that's basically what we're looking for. Um, so right now, as far as the broad market, my analysis says it is not a great time to be in Chinese stocks across the board. I will disclose that I have one uh, bullish play on one Chinese stock in my Cycle 9 Alert um, service. And so, but, but that, that one stock is really going in counter to the market. It has positive trend, it has market beating momentum, it's at its 52 week highs. Um, what I really liked about this stock is it's a discretionary stock. Uh, so the folks that still do have their jobs and have money and they're spending money in the Chinese economy, um, which is which is growing. The middle class is spending a lot more money. Uh, it's not just a manufacturing economy any longer. Um, so this stock, what I, but what I really liked about this stock is that they already reported first quarter earnings. So China went on lockdown about two months earlier than the U.S. So while our, the U.S. companies are going to report awful Q2 uh, earnings, uh, and Q1 wasn't quite as bad because it only incorporated part of the lockdown, uh, China is basically the worst is over in, in their first quarter. So um, this company already reported Q1 results. They weren't great, but the market responded uh, with resilience to it. The stock traded higher after the earnings report, even though they showed you know, double digit contractions in sales and revenue and things like that. Um, this is a huge company. It's a fast food conglomerate. So th my thesis is that this company is gonna keep on rolling and, and do just fine through this. The worst is over for them, not only uh, as far as the business discontinuity, uh, but also in terms of the reporting of Q1 results. So that's just one way that I would look for a tactical opportunity to make uh, money in Chinese stocks rather than trying to be a, you know, a geopolitical analyst and figure out what in the world um, these, these folks are going to do. And, and, and I want to I, I make two points and, and then we'll move on to the next topic. One, I asked the question to you on that, that way on purpose <laughs> because I know that's the way a lot of investors are thinking is that, you know, okay, because this is Chinese, as a Chinese company, should I invest? But the way you answer that, I think, is, is dead on the money. And, and that is that whenever you look at a stock, whenever professionals look at, look, look at stocks, their filters don't necessarily include, and I say this as a broad statement, they don't include nationality. That, that's not the starting point. The starting point is, is looking at other indicators, uh, whatever indicators that you use in your trading system, whether you're using a system like Adams or whether you're doing your own or whatever. Your first filter isn't, okay, where's this company from? And I think that's a, I think that, that's an important thing to to distinguish here, is that when you if you are a serious trader, serious about making money, and all investors that should be your your first priority, I would imagine, you know, you can't look at that that way. I mean, you you've got to consider the indicators, not the origin, not not the not the politics behind it or anything like that, because I think the one thing is is that. Like with the news cycle, if the stock market moves on the news cycle, those moves are very minute and they don't last very long because what's news right now is different in an hour and different in two hours and it, and it fluctuates. So if you're basing your trend, if, if you're basing your trading strategy on, okay, I'm only going to buy American or I'm only going to buy this or buy that, then you're going to sell yourself short because you're going to miss out on some profits on the table elsewhere. 
Uh, you know, you look at uh, another international company that will throw out there is Pete's Coffee. They just uh, they just launched in the uh, in the Netherlands, I believe, on the on the stocks Netherlands market. This is a company that has been huge as a private company and is is even bigger as a public company. Now, are you telling me that because it's a a a stock in uh, in the Netherlands that you don't want to take advantage of those kind of profits, of those potential gains? The answer is no. I mean, it should be no. If it's not no, then you're probably investing for the wrong reasons. So I think the way Adam laid that out is, is that that should not be your first your, your first eye here. Your first eye on a stock should be look at the ticker and then look at the indicators. That's where you should be looking first. And if you want to filter into other ancillary things after that, that's fine. But let it meet your criteria of, okay, this is something that's worth buying or this is something that I should sell because these indicators told me so, not because it's Chinese, not because it's American, not because it's a Canadian cannabis company or anything like that. that that's not it at all. You need to be looking at, did this trigger something that I should buy? Is this first off a company that I'm already in that I love? And two, or that I can or I'm not in, and I and I really could get behind. And then two, what are the indicators telling me I should be doing with it? Not oh well, it's Chinese, so I'm not going to buy it. I mean, really, because if you'd invested in Alibaba, um, or let's just say you know, let's just use JD as as the example, if you'd invested in JD back in in 2018, you'd be up almost 200 percent if you held on to the stock, regardless of what company where, where it's based out of. I mean, that's a huge gain. That's a huge gain to hold for a year and a half. That's a massive jump. It, it went from $19 to $57 in a year and a half. That's a massive jump. And you're telling me that as an investor, because it's Chinese, you're going you're, you're gonna to kick those profits to the curb. I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's the way you should look at it. So I think Adam is, is right on the money, uh, no pun intended, that, that you know, you've got you've to take out all that outside noise and look strictly at your screener and what it's telling you to do. That, that, that's, that's the, or, or someone like Adam, what he's telling you to do. Cause Adam's not looking at it as like, well, it's a Chinese company. So yeah, we're going to pass. No, oh, no. Why would you do that? If it's a Chinese company that has strong indicators that are stronger than American companies, then wouldn't your money be better served switching it over to the Chinese company? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a thought to have. The, the next thing I want to talk about real briefly, Adam is, is, you know, I mentioned that, that this stock market is not behaving normally. And I, I think we can all agree that it is something that it, we, we've not seen in, a long time, if ever, uh, the fact that the market is 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 trending so much higher. I read somewhere that the S and P, the Nasdaq, and uh, the Dow since mid February are up forty percent, and the Russell two thousand is up almost fifty one percent over that time. And we are in the middle of a of an epidemic of a of a pandemic, uh, if you will. Um, you know, economic indicators are telling us that we're in a recession. Um, but yet the stock market is just on cruise control going upwards. Now, the important thing to understand here is that the stock market is not the economy. Do not confuse the two because they are not the same. There will be slight movements that the market may make that may be related to the economy slightly, but they are not one and the same. They are, they are, they are, they are completely separate from each other. So you can't expect that if it's a recession, the market's down. And if it's, you know, if we are in, if, if it's the good times, then the market's up. It doesn't work that way. However, I just find it very interesting that the market is behaving this wildly if you factor in all those things. But what I want to ask you specifically, Adam, is I know that as part of, of your services, you look specifically at uh, various sectors and which sectors per, are, are performing or triggering well, and which ones are triggering that aren't triggering well. And you've got those based in a rank in a ranking system that I'm not going to get into because that's part of a, of a, of a service. But I do want to ask you uh, what services, what, what, what sectors now are you seeing that are performing well in this high market time? And then conversely, which ones are not performing as well as you might expect? Yeah, so right now there has been a bifurcation and you're exactly right. I mean, the market is not the economy. And I look at that as similar um, as the news cycle. You know, the news cycle is what it is, but it's not necessarily where you're making your money. You're making your money on price action. Likewise, the economy has a heavy influence on where the market is and the market is trying to forecast where the economy is going to be in the future. Um, it's forward looking, but at the same time, you aren't making your money in the economy. You're making your money in the stock market, in the price action. So that's really, you know, I'm looking at figuring out how over two to three month periods of time can I find the, the best part of the stock market and avoid the worst parts of the stock market. So this has been a very atypical crash and recovery. Uh, it happened much quicker than most bear markets uh, unfold. Uh, it also, the, the V-shaped recovery in stocks does not at all match the shape of the recovery in the economy. We have not had much of any of a recovery in the economy as yet. 
um, and we won't really be able to see any uh, sustainable evidence of a sustainable recovery for quite a while. But right now, the stock market is forecasting a very quick, uh, you know, back to normal recovery. Whether that ends up being right or not, we don't know. But we don't have time to wait. We don't need to wait. We can still be opportunistic in the in the short term and over the medium term and figure out which sectors are benefiting from this disruption and which ones are, are kind of being hampered by it. Uh, so right now, um, the healthcare sector, it's kind of obvious, but the healthcare sector was one of the first sectors to really uh, rise to the top through the crisis. Uh, a lot of that's driven by biotech companies and genomics companies that are trying to fight the coronavirus or that at least uh, our society has been reminded of the importance of healthcare, uh, whether it's just to keep us alive or whether it's to, as a point of national security. Uh, but, you know, healthcare is certainly um, is, is at the top of our list right now. I actually have two plays in healthcare, bullish plays in healthcare and my Cycle 9 Alert Service. Uh, both are doing quite well. So that's one sector trend that we're riding. Um, another one that's come about more recently in the past week and a half is consumer discretionary sector. That's really um, counterintuitive. I mean, the, the unemployment rate shot from one of the lowest to one of the highest in a matter of months. So you would think that people aren't spending money on discretionary items. Uh, but they seem to be, or at least the stock market seems to have company and uh, confidence in, in these types of companies. So I don't know if that's because the affluent haven't been affected and they're still spending money. I don't know if it's people that um, have you know, are being more careful with their money or staying home and, and their jobs have been disrupted, but they're still spending some money on you know on everyday small ticket item luxury things. I don't know the the underlying uh, driver of that, but what my my charts are showing me and what the price action is showing me is that investors are bidding up. Uh, consumer discretionary stocks. So that's another trend where um, it's another sector where the trend is is positive. The the market beating momentum relative to the broader stock market is positive, and so that's another good, good place to look, uh, even though it's counterintuitive. Which is often the be the best trades come from counterintuitive ideas. Um, also, the material sector has just risen to the top of my rankings this past week and reestablished its bullish trend today. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I mean, obviously the oil crash uh, really hampered the material sector. Uh, gold stocks or gold prices and precious metals, gold and silver on the on the upside have, have kind of buoyed it, uh, but we are seeing more uh, turn to, to the bullish side uh, in the materials sector. Um, also technology, technology is still, still strong. That's kind of not surprising. Technology over the past, this, this market cycle has kind of shown uh, to be very, very uh, consistent outperformer. Um, right now, the technology sector is in a uh, bullish trend, but its momentum isn't uh, all that impressive right now. So we're kind of holding back on that for now. Uh, but I do expect uh, to see some technology names over the next month or so. Um, as far as industry groups, the semiconductor uh, industry group is on fire. Uh, one of my systems uh, alerted us to a bullish opportunity there at the very end of uh, March, on March 30th. And uh, you know, one, one semiconductor XSD uh, ETF is up about 40%. Uh, also, there's an ETF that's more thematic. Uh, it's based on the internet of things. Uh, so it's called SNSR or sensor, and uh, that's another ETF that's up about 37% since the end of March. So that's another place to find some to, to find some opportunity and uh, to find some bullish trends. So again, you really have to you can't look at the broad market. You you know you don't necessarily want to say do I want to buy the whole market right now. You want to kind of dig in and figure out which sectors are, are benefiting from this environment right now and which ones aren't. And as long as that trend continues for the next you know several months, there's opportunity to make money there. Very good. I think that's uh, that's all information that if you're an investor, you need to hope you hope you took notes. If not, uh, hit the rewind button and and go back to it because I think that's all very uh, very critical information to have if you're if you're investing in this kind of a market. So uh, um, markets are looking to probably close up on Friday, which is uh, certainly a, a good end to the week. Uh, what it does next week, you like to say you could kind of make a, an educated guess, but in this environment, I not a good idea. <laughs> just because it fluctuates so much and one thing can set it off. So, um, you know, I, I think there's, there's some interesting opportunities out there by all means. I think if you, uh, uh are, are looking for some advice, I think Adam Odell is definitely one you want to look at. Uh, if you can check him out on our website, moneymarkets.com, you can click up at the very top and, uh, obviously find out more information about Adam and, and, and the services that he offers, uh, because they are, they are definitely worthwhile, worth your time and, uh, and worth your money to get into because he's, uh, he's got a very strong track record and that, and that track record has, has not wavered. So definitely uh, would encourage, uh, encourage you to do that. Um, Adam, thank you for coming on and, and, and joining us uh, today. And I hope you have a great weekend. Uh, we'll have much, much more next week. Uh, we'll bring Adam back on, on, uh, on Friday as we always do. We'll talk about some great things there. Uh, I uh, don't know what we're going to talk about yet because, uh, again, with the market fluctuating the way it is, it could be any number of things.
things. So, uh, but uh, listen to us on uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, uh, uh, any other various uh, uh, podcast indicators out there. Our YouTube channel, obviously, if you're watching this on video, uh, subscribe. Get alerts to uh, when we put out new video. We're going to be starting to roll out uh, even more video here uh, very soon uh, that won't necessarily be podcast related. So you're, you'll probably want to get uh, get in on that. And uh, obviously, check us out on moneymarkets.com. Uh, news every day, uh, seven days a week. Uh, we try to we try to kind of cut through the noise and and uh, give you the information you need for safe and sound investments. So uh, for Adam O'Dell, Chief Investment Strategist for Money and Markets, I'm Matt Clark. Uh, certainly glad you're with us. Have a great weekend, and until next time, safe trading.